podcast. Welcome to the Avram Davidson universe, where you will get to listen to some of the best short stories ever written. As a youth, Neil Gaiman fell in love with Avram's stories. Philip K. Dick adored him. Ursula Le Guin thought his tales wonderful, and Ray Bradbury compared him to Kipler. Each episode will include a special guest, an amazing short story, and a discussion of that story. Enjoy classic tales such as Or All the Seas with Oysters, The Golem, The Sources of the Nile, and many others. How could you be? It sounds like a story to me, yeah. Sounds like a story to me. All right, Melissa, we're live. <laughs> Hi, Seth. <laughs> great. It's great to uh, meet you in person. Yeah, it is. It was good talking to you before, but it's good to see you. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think I'll start with how how I met you or, or how I found you, which I thought was kind of fascinating. Uh, you know, two things. One, one of the things that I had been thinking about, uh, you know, Avram was a professor uh, at a couple of schools or a, a writer in residence. And he really liked to encourage and help new up and coming authors. And I thought that would be fun to also, as part of the Auburn Davidson universe, bring on people who love Auburn's work, who maybe not necessarily, didn't necessarily know him because there aren't that many folks uh, that still are around that knew him. Uh, so I thought it'd be great to bring up some up and coming authors, talk about how, why they love Avram and also introduce them uh, so more people can find you. Uh, so that, that's kind of why I decided to do this. Uh, in terms of how I found you was I had noticed on Twitter that you had made a reference of uh, Ursus of Ultima Thule and I was like, whoa, <laughs> who's this? Uh, and so I, I, I had to talk to you and I, we had to become friends. So I'd love to hear about how you found Avram, uh, what made you make that reference. And I also noticed you mentioned him as one of the writers you'd like to write more like on your website. So I'll let you kind of introduce yourself. And talk about that. <laughs> okay, so how I found him was there's this little old bookstore in Silva, North Carolina. And I used to live in North Carolina. And this bookstore had all kinds of really old books that were good quality. And I just saw the cover and thought, hmm, this is interesting. And I looked at it and read the dust jacket and I had to get it. <laughs> and so that was how I found Ursus. And I'm not a big rereader because I feel like there are so many books I'm never going to be able to read all of them. So it's rare for me to reread a book. And I like that book. I have reread it so many times. <laughs> um, I like his characterization. There's a strong sense of character just right off the bat. And the setting is just very rich. It draws you in. I know he's been criticized for plot not being his strongest point. And I think your mom helped him with that. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I just really like that aspect of it. I feel like it's kind of um, dense, but not like in a bad way. But I mean, ugh, <laughs> I'm getting nervous and <laughs> talking to <laughs> What I mean by dense is that it's concise and there's just a really deep sense of what he's saying. It's not using a lot of words to say what he's trying to get across. I'm trying to say what I'm talking now. <laughs> no, that's great. What, what, um, I mean, in terms of other books, are there, you know, is that, is that your favorite, would you say of his or? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's my favorite. And I was thinking about this a lot last night. One of the things I really like about Avram is that um, he has this way of kind of drawing you in and then the story doesn't go where you think it might go. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> and um, like, I read this thing that he wrote about H.P. Lovecraft and I've heard him linked to H.P. Lovecraft in the past. 
in the idea that they both wrote kind of out there science fiction kind of genre bending stories and you know <laughs> he ended it with calling him like a nut job or something like that. <laughs> so funny and I liked it though because it made me kind of think you know H.P. Lovecraft has really been criticized for being pretty racist and pretty exclusive but it felt like in a lot of Avram's work he's kind of got this inclusivity that he's really pushing where it's someone who like in Now Let Us Sleep, is on the inside. They're not on the outside looking in. They're on the inside, but they're being introspective about what is happening in the situation. And they are challenging the norms of that situation. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I, I feel uh, as I've gotten to know Avram's work more, he, he without a doubt, was incredibly empathetic uh, as a person. I mean, you know, he had his faults. Uh, he was described as cranky. He's been described as, you know, uh, you know, the story of throwing a, a typewriter at Harlan Ellison once uh, <laughs> because it was a German typewriter. Uh, you know, but but he, without a doubt, he was empathetic, and and he also, I, I also noticed he grew. Uh, as culture shifted, you know, some people stay with the way culture was, but he tended to, I think, in some ways be ahead of his time, you know, both in terms of writing about Native Americans, both in terms of, you know, and we'll get to, to this a little bit later, and, you know, initially when he wrote, he, he very rarely had female characters, but seemed to evolve, and even some of his unpublished works include stronger female characters. So I just noticed an evolution of him as he grew with the times and, and even his thinking grew as he, he aged. So anyways, I have fascinating uh, insight there. Uh, well, in terms of you, you know, you were kind enough to send me one of your stories, which was Gattaca meets Black Swan. And I loved it. <laughs> I think I think it's incredible. Uh, people should seek it out. Uh, it's uh, what's where is where can they find it right now? Um, bewildering stories. Okay, and I think it's just you. If you just search Google bewildering stories, I think it's uh, I wrote it down. It's uh, what uh, issue eight eight one. Yes. Uh, I mean it's fantastic. So I'd love to hear why you wrote that particular story. And I guess I have one question about it, which was, I understand it had to be a certain length, uh, but it, it, I felt like it had to be the start of something as opposed to just that standalone short story, or at least I hope it was the start of something. I, <laughs> I, wanna, I want the whole universe. I wanna know where it goes. Anyways, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that story. Um, that story kind of just came to me because I love ballet and I took ballet for years. I was never professional, but I love ballet and my husband loves football. <laughs> football definitely has, you know, a performance enhancing drug problem. So I thought one day, what if ballet was treated that same way? And um, a couple of years ago, there was someone from the Royal Birmingham Ballet who said that it is a problem in the UK and that it should be addressed there. But I don't think it really has the same um, culture here mm -hmm. in the US. Um, in the 1990s, in 1997, there was a dancer at the Boston Ballet named Heidi Gunther and she was anorexic and she had been taking appetite suppressants, I believe. I'm not 100% sure on that, but she ended up dying from anorexia. And I was a kid at the time, and that was kind of scary to me because in ballet, there were definitely some girls who had problems. I definitely had 
mental health issues regarding my weight. And that was a contributing factor to it. So um, <laughs> that kind of is where that story came from. Okay. And then I love the movie Gattaca and it's kind <laughs> of like an inverse of that movie. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating. I really recommend people grab a copy of it. Uh, in, in terms of, you know, one of the things I was thinking a lot about, I, I come from a triathlon background and, you know, and certainly in cycling, everyone knows how much usage there is that, that's been going on swimming, even running track and field. And my understanding now in triathlon, even at the amateur level, you go to Ironman and they're talking about maybe 25% of the, uh, of the amateur athletes now at Ironman Hawaii are, are maybe using performance enhancing drugs. And then I thought, wow, in ballet, I mean, I guess the idea would be it would get you potentially a better job. It would allow you to become a better performer. So I imagine it, it could be a huge problem. So, and then obviously it goes into all sorts of directions. So I don't want to give away the story, but it's, it's, I loved it. Uh, well, let's talk about today's story, uh, which I'd love to know. It's uh, What Strange Stars and Sky, which uh, was originally published in the magazine of fantasy and science fiction in December of 1963. What made you choose this story in particular? I really enjoy that this story focuses on a woman. And <laughs> it's Dame Philippa, and she's not like... <laughs> There's this term sometimes used in writing of a sexy lampshade where <laughs> a female character could be replaced by a sexy lampshade. And that would be, <laughs> that'd be fine. It wouldn't affect the story. <laughs> and um, like Harlan Ellison has some sexy <laughs> lampshade stories. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I like that. I like that it's a period piece and that it has this kind of eldritch sense to the sci-fi i just really love the setting in the uk and it's true to that setting as far as i know i mean <laughs> i've not been to the uk and i certainly didn't live in that time period but it just feels accurate <laughs> yeah I, I mean there's no question I, I i agree that she is a strong female character and i i was thinking back to Auburn's stories and, and there's a mix, I mean, without a doubt, there's some where he has some strong female characters. And then there's, I think I was thinking of, I love this story actually of Rourke. Did you ever read Rourke? I haven't read that one. Okay. So, I mean, totally like, obviously he wrote this as he needed to pay the bills. <laughs> That's the way I saw it. <laughs> but it's also a really fun story, be a great movie, you know, that type of story. But the, but the female character in it would need to be developed, especially nowadays. Uh, so, so there's no doubt about it. Well, I say let's let's go ahead and and uh, take a listen. You, okay. You All right. What strange stars and skies! The terrible affair of Dame Philippa Garrick, which struck horror in all who knew of her noble life and mysterious disappearance, arose in large measure from inordinate confidence in her fellow creatures, particularly such of them as she might, from time to time, in those nocturnal wanderings which so alarmed her family and friends, encounter in circumstances more than commonly distressed. This great-hearted and misfortunate woman would be, we may be sure, the first to deplore any lessening of philanthropy, any diminution of charity, or even of charitable feeling, resultant from her own dreadfully sudden and all but inexplicable fate. Yet one feels such a result is inevitable." I am not aware that Dame Philippa ever made use of any heraldic devices or mottos, but had she done so, do what is right, come what may, would have been eminently appropriate. It is not any especial sense of competency on my part which has caused me to resolve that a record of the matter should and must be made. 
Miss Mothermer, Dame Philippa's faithful secretary companion, to say nothing of her cousin, Lord Fitzmaurice Banstock, would each, under ordinary circumstances, be far more capable than I of delineating the events in question. But the circumstances, of course, are as far from being ordinary as they can possibly be. Miss Mothermer has for the past six months, next Monday fortnight, been in seclusion at Dr. Hardesty's establishment near Sutton Hoo. And whilst I can state quite certainly the falsehood of the rumour that her affairs have been placed in charge of the master in lunacy, nevertheless, Dr. Hardesty is adamant that the few visitors she is permitted to receive must make no reference whatsoever to the affair of last Guy Fawkes Day, the man with the false nose, or the unspeakably evil Eurasian Mortilal Smith. As for Lord Fitzmaurice Banstock, though I am aware that he has the heart of a lion and nerves of steel, his extreme shyness, in no small measure the result of his unfortunate physical condition, must advertise to all who know him the unlikelihood of his undertaking the task. It falls to me, therefore, and no one else, to proceed forthwith in setting down the chronicle of those untoward and unhappy events. Visitors to Argyle Court, which abuts onto Primrose Alley, one of that maze of noisome passages off the commercial road which the zeal and conscience of the London County Council cannot much longer suffer to remain untouched, visitors to Argyle Court will have noticed the large signboard affixed to the left-hand door as one enters, reading, if the Lord will, his word shall be preached here each Lord's day at seven o'clock in the evening, all welcome, it gives notice of the Sabbath activities of Major Bohan, whose weekdays are devoted to his sacred labours with the strict antinomian tramcar and omnibus tract society, the name of which appears on a small brass plate under the sign. Had the Major been present that 5th of November, a different story it would be which I have to tell. But he had gone to attend at an anti-papistical sermon and prayer meeting, holden to mark the day at the Putney Tabernacle. The fetid reek of the court, which has overwhelmed more than one less delicately bred than Dame Philippa, bears, besides the effluvia of unwashed beds and bodies emanating from the so-called seaman's lodging-house of Evan Bachluelin, the rotting refuse of the back part of a cook-shop of the lowest sort, bad drains, and the putrid odours of Samson Stone's wool pullery, the tainted breath of the filthy Thames itself, whose clotted waters ebb and flow not far off. On many an evening, when the lowering sun burned dully in the dirty sky, and the soiled swans squatted like pigs in the mud banks of London River, the tall figure of Dame Philippa would turn, for the time being, from the waterfront, and make her way towards the quickening traffic of the commercial road and Goodman Fields, proceeding through Salem Yard, Fenugreek Close, Primrose Alley, and Argyle Court. The fashionable and sweet-smelling ladies of the West End, as well as their wretched and garishly bedaubed fallen sisters, smelling of cheap scent and sweetened gin, just at this hour beginning those peregrinations of the East End's mean and squalid streets, for which those less tender than Dame Philippa might think them dead to all shame, were wearing, with fashion's license, their skirts higher than they had ever been before. But Dame Philippa, though she never criticised the choice of others, still wore hers long, and sometimes, with one hand, she would lift them an inch or two to avoid the foul pavements, though she never drew back from contact, neither an inch nor an instant, with any human being, however filthy or diseased. 
Sometimes Miss Mothermer's bird-like little figure was with her friend and employer, perhaps assuming for the moment the burden of the famous army kit-bag. Sometimes, and such times Dame Philippa walked more slowly, Lord Fitzmaurice Banstock accompanied her, but usually only quite late at night and along the less frequented thoroughfares, where such people whom they were likely to meet were too preoccupied with their own unhappy concerns, or too brutalized and too calloused to stare at the muscular but misshapen peer for more than a second or two. The kit-bag had been the gift of Piggott, Batman, to Dame Philippa's brother, the late Lieutenant Colonel Sir Chidiock Garrick, when she had sent him out to the Transvaal in hopes that that province's warmer and drier air would be kindlier to his gas-ruined lungs than the filthy fogs and sweats of England. The kit-bag usually contained, to my own knowledge, on an average evening, the following— Five to ten pounds in coins, as well as several ten-shilling notes folded quite small. Two sets of singlets and drawers, two shirts, and two pairs of stockings, none of them new, but all clean and mended. A dozen slices of bread and butter wrapped in packets of three. Ten or twenty copies of a pamphlet-sized edition of the Gospel of St. John in various languages a Britannia metal pint flask of a good French brandy, a quantity of hard-cooked eggs, and an equal supply of salt and pepper in small screws of paper, four handkerchiefs, first aid equipment, two reels of cotton with needles, a packet of mixed toffees, the Book of Common Prayer. Fifteen packets of five woodbine cigarettes, into each of which she had thrust six wooden matches. One pocket mirror. A complete change of infant's clothing. Several small cakes of soap. Several pocket combs. A pair of scissors. And three picture postcards of the royal family. All this arranged with maximum efficiency in minimum space, but not packed so tightly that Dame Philippa's fingers could not instantly produce the requisite article. It will be observed that she was prepared to deal with a wide variety of occasions. Tragic, infinitely tragic though it is, not even a person of Dame Philippa's great experience among what a late American author termed, not infelicitously, the people of the abyss, could have prepared either to expect or to deal on this occasion with such persons as the man wearing the false nose or the hideously, the unspeakably evil Eurasian Mortilal Smith. The countenance of Mortilal Smith, once observed, is not one likely ever to be forgotten, and proves a singular and disturbing exception to the rule that Eurasians are generally of a comely appearance, it being broad and frog-like in its flatness, protuberance of the eyes, which are green and wet-looking, a reverse U-shaped mouth, and its multiplicity of warts or wart-like swellings. Most striking of all, however, is the air of slyness, malevolence, of hostility, both overt and covert, towards everything which is kindly and decent and, in a word, human. Mortilal Smith has, since his first appearance in the United Kingdom, been the subject of unremitting police attention— and for some time now has gained the sinister distinction of being mentioned more often in the annual report of the League of Nations Commission on the Traffic in Women and Children than any other resident of London. He has often been arrested and detained on suspicion, but the impossibility of bringing witnesses to testify against him has invariably resulted in his release.
Evidences of his nefarious commerce have come from places so far distant as the province of Santa Cruz in the Republic of Bolivia and the native Indian states of Patiala and Cuchibihar, as well as two of the trucial sheikdoms, the free city of Danzig and Deaf Smith County in the Commonwealth of Texas none of which, it must be regretted, is admissible in proceedings at the Old Bailey. As he is a British subject by birth, he can be neither deported nor denied admission on his return from frequent trips abroad. He is known to be always ready to purchase, he is entirely eclectic as to the nature of the merchandise, and he pays well, and he pays in gold. It is necessary only to add that, offered any obstacle, affront, or rebuff, he is unremitting in his hostility, which combines the industry of the West with the patience of the East. Smith occupies both sides of the semi-detached villa in Maida Vale, of which he owns the freehold. Its interior is crammed with opulent furnishings from all round the world, and stinks of stale beer, spilt gin, incense, curry, raw fish, the foul breaths and bodies of those he deals with, and of chips fried in ghee. His long, lank, and clotted hair is covered in scented grease, and on his fingers are rings of rubies, diamonds, pearls, and other precious stones worth with their settings a prince's ransom. Add only the famous negro-head opal worn in his stained silk four-in-hand, and for which second officer Smollett of the Cutty Sark is said to have strangled Mrs. Pigler, and there you have the creature mortal Al Smith in all his repulsive essence. The night of that 5th of November found the unfortunates among whom this great lady pursued her noble work no more inclined than in other years to celebrate the delivery from gunpowder plot of King James the Sixth and First and his English Parliament. Here and there, to be sure, in the glare of the gin palaces of the main thoroughfares, a group of grimy and tattered children had gotten up an even more unsavoury guy. For them, Dame Philippa had provided herself with a large supply of pennies. But that night, as on most other nights, there was little enough evidence of innocent gaiety. There are multitudes, literally multitudes, in this vast labyrinth of London, for whom the normal institutions of a human society seem barely to exist. There are physicians in the East End, hospitals and dispensaries, yet numbers past counting will suffer injury and disease, and creep off to die like brutes in their dim corners, or, if they are fortunate, by brute strength survive. There are public baths in every borough, and facilities for washing clothes, yet many never touch water to their skins, and wear their rags unchanged till they rot. Babes are born without benefit of any human witness to the event save their own wretched mothers, though a word to the great hospital in Whitechapel Road will bring midwife and physician without charge. And while eating places abound, from quite decent restaurants down to the dirty holes in the walls, offering tuppenny cups of tea and sixpenny papers of breaded smelts and greasy chips, and while private and public charity arrangements guarantee that no one need quite die of hunger who will ask to be fed, no day goes by without its toll from famine of those who, having their hoards of copper and silver, are disabled by their madness from spending either tuppence or shilling, or who find it much, much easier to die like dogs in their secluded kennels than come forward and declare their needs. As the pigeons in Trafalgar Square have learned when and where the old man with the bag of breadcrumbs will appear, 
as the ownerless cats near Billingsgate can tell what time and in what place to scavenge for the scraps of fish the dustman misses, as the rats in the sewers beneath Smithfield Market know without error the manner in which they seek their meat from God, just so from this stinking alley and from that crumbling tenement, here from underneath a dripping archway and there from a disused warehouse, slinking and creeping and peering fearfully and furtively and sidling with their ragged backs pressed against ragged walls, there appeared by one and by one the cast-offs, one must call them humans, for what other name is theirs, the self-exiled, the utterly incapable, to take in their quick reptilian grasp the things Dame Philippa had for them. She knew, knew by instinct and knew by practice, which ones would benefit by a shilling and which by half a crown. She knew those to whom money was of no more use than cowrie shells, but who would relish the meat of a hard-cooked egg, and the savour of the tiny scrap of seasoning which went with it, knew those who would be hopelessly baffled by the labour of cracking the shell, but who could manage to rip the paper off a packet of bread and butter huddled and crouched in the rank familiar darkness of their burrows, tearing the soft food with their toothless gums knew those who would fight, squealing or wordlessly, fight like cornered stoats rather than surrender a single one of the unspeakably filthy rags into which their unspeakably filthy bodies were sewn, and those who would strip by some forgotten water tap and wash themselves and put on clean things, but only if provided them, having no longer in many cases the ability to procure either soap or singlets for themselves. She also knew who could be coaxed another foot or two up the path to self-respect by the tempting bait of mirror and comb, the subtle appeal such things made to the ravaged remnants of pride. And she knew when even a handful of toffee or a small picture of the charismatic king and queen could brighten a dim corner or an eroded mind. And often, though not always, with her on this humble and saintly mission went her faithful secretary companion, Miss Mothermer, though by herself Miss Mothermer would have died a thousand dreadful deaths in such places, and sometimes Dame Philippa was accompanied by her unhappy and unfortunate cousin, Lord Fitzmaurice Banstock, though usually he shunned the company of any but his few familiar servants. On this particular night, Moore Winnie, his chauffeur footman, had been obliged by a Guy Fawkes bonfire and its attendant crowd to drive the heavily curtained Rolls motor car by a different and less familiar route. Hence he arrived later at the usual place of rendezvous. Miss Mothermer and Dame Philippa, tall figure and tiny one, picture hat and toque, had come by, and, as was the unspoken understanding, had not tarried. So many considerations affected the presence or absence of Lord Fitzmaurice Banstock. Was he engaged in a conversation particularly interesting by means of his amateur wireless radio equipment? Was he in more pain than a certain degree? Was he in less pain than a certain degree? Was the moon too bright? For one or more of these reasons the star-cursed noble lord might not come, despite his having said he might. The obedient Morwinny did not turn his head as his master slowly and awkwardly crept from the vehicle, inch by inch over the black silk upholstery. Nor, well trained, did he suggest leaving the car in a garage and coming with his master. He waited a few moments after the door closed, then he drove straight away back to Banstock House, where he stayed for precisely three hours, turning the tarot cards over and over again with old Ghouls, the butler, and Mrs. Ox, the cook. 
On this 5th of November night, they observed that the priestess, the fool, and the hanged man turned up with more than their common frequency, and were much exercised to conjecture what, if anything, this might portend, and for whom. And at the conclusion of three hours, he put on his cap and coat, and drove back to the place set. Besides those nameless and all but formless figures from the silent world of whom I had spoken above, there were others who awaited and welcomed Dame Philippa's presence, and among them were women with names like Flossie and Jewel and Our Rose, Clarabelle and Princess Mick and Jenny the Hen, two Bob Betty and Opaline and Queenie Kate. She spoke to every one of them, gave them, if they required it, or thought they might, or if Dame Philippa thought they might, the money needed to make up the sum demanded by their friends or protectors, money for rent or food or what it might be, if they had passed the stage where their earnings could possibly be enough to concern the swine who had earlier lived on them. She tended to their cuts and bruises the poor wretches received in the way of business, and which they were too ashamed to bring before the very proper nurses and the young, light-heartedly cruel interns. Sometimes she interceded for them with the police, and sometimes she summoned the police to their assistance. Her manner of doing this was to direct Miss Mothermer to blow upon the police whistle she wore upon a lanyard, Dame Philippa not liking the vibration this made upon her own lips. Those to whom Dame Philippa may have seemed but a tall, gaunt, eccentric woman given to wearing old-fashioned dresses and hats which ill became her, would do well to recollect that she was among the very first to be honoured with the title of Dame, and that His Majesty's Government did not take this step exclusively in recognition of her career prior to her retirement as an educationist, or of her work, through entirely legal methods, on behalf of the women's suffrage movement. It was close to midnight when the two ladies arrived in Primrose Alley, and Dame Philippa rapped lightly with her walking-stick upon the window of a woman in whose maternity she had interested herself, actually persuading the young woman, who was not over-bright, to accept medical attention, eat something resembling proper food, and have the child christened in the nearby, and unfortunately ill-attended, Church of St. Gustav Widdish. She rapped a second time, loud enough, she hoped, to wake the mother, but not loud enough to wake the child. As it happened, it was the father she woke, a young man who circulated among three or four women in a sort of tandem polygamy, and who informed the lady that the baby had been sent to its mother's people in Westham, and who begged her, not altogether disdainfully, for sweet Christ's sake to bugger off and let him get back to sleep again. Dame Philippa left him to his feculent slumbers in absolute but resigned certainty that this time next year she would again be called upon to swaddle, victual, and renounce by proxy the world, the flesh, and the devil on behalf of another squalling token of his vigour, unless the young woman should perhaps miscarry, as she had done twice before, or carry out her own suggestion of dropping the child in the river by accident-like. It was as she turned from the window, then, that Dame Philippa first clearly observed the man wearing the false nose as she thought, because of the Guy Fawkes festivities, though it appears Miss Mothermer instantly suspected that he did so by way of disguise, although she had been aware, without giving consideration to the matter, that there had been footsteps behind her. All inquiries as to this man's identity or motive have failed, but the singularity of his appearance is such that, unless he has been secretly conveyed out of the kingdom, he cannot long continue to evade the vigilance of the police. Thinking nothing further of the matter, as we may assume, Dame Philippa and her companion continued their way into Argyle Court. 
the sound of voices and the odour of hot gin and lemon, both proceeding from a bow window greatly resembling in carving and overhang the forecastle of an ancient sailing ship, directed her attention to the gas jet, which burned redly in the close air, illuminating the sign of the seaman's lodging house. In times gone by, even Bach Llewellyn had been a notorious crimp. Board regulations, closely attended to, had almost put a stop to this, as far as vessels of British register were concerned. It was widely said, however, and widely believed, that the masters of foreign vessels putting into London with cargoes of coffee, copra, palm oil, fuel oil, hardwood, and pulpwood, and finding members of their crew swallowed up by the smoke, often appealed to the giant Silurian. He sang bass in the choir of Capel Kimrig for replacements, and did not appeal in vain. Protests entered by surprise seamen, whose heads cleared of chloral in the Bay of Biscay, when they found themselves on board of strange vessels whose language they often did not recognise, let alone speak, would, in the general course of things, prove quite bootless. As Dame Philippa's attention was distracted to the window, two men, who must have been huddled silently at the other side of the court, came suddenly towards the two ladies, reeling and cursing, striking fiercely at one another, and giving off the fumes of that poisonous mixture of methylated spirits and cheap port wine, commonly called Red Biddy. The ladies took a few steps in confusion, not knowing precisely what course to take, nor having much time to consider it. They could not go forward because of the two men fighting, and it seemed that when they attempted to walk to the side, the bruisers were there, cutting off their way too. Dame Philippa therefore turned quickly, leading Miss Mothermer in the same direction, but stopped short as, out of Primrose Alley, whence they had just issued, darted the man who had been wearing the false nose. He made a curious sound as he did so. If he spoke words is not certain. What is certain is that he had plucked the false pasteboard from his face, it was hideously pockmarked, and that the flesh underneath was a mere convoluted hollow, like some gross navel, but nothing like a human nose. Miss Mothermer gave a stifled cry and drew back, but Dame Philippa, though certainly no less startled, placed a reassuring hand on her companion's arm, and courteously awaited what this unfortunate might have to say or to ask. He beckoned, he gestured, he mewled and gibbered. Murmuring to Miss Mothermer that he evidently stood in need of some assistance, and that they were bound to endeavour to find what it was, Dame Philippa stepped forward to follow him. For an instant only Miss Mothermer hesitated, but the two larrikins menaced from behind, and she was too fearful for herself and for Dame Philippa to allow her to go on alone. Perforce she followed." She followed into a door which stood open, as if waiting. If her testimony, and if one may give so succinct a name to confused and diffused ramblings noted down by Dr. Hardesty over a period of several months, may be relied on, the door lay but a few paces into Primrose Alley. The facts, however, are that no such door exists. The upper part of the alley contains the tenements officially designated as Gubbins's buildings, and called commonly the Jakes. Entrance is through a covered archway twenty feet long, which divides into two shallow flights of steps, from each of which a hallway leads to the individual apartments. It was in one of these, the window and not the door of which faced the alley, that the young parents of Dame Philippa Garrick's godchild were lodging. The lower part of the alley on the same side is occupied by the blind bulk of the back of the old flower warehouse. The opposite side is lined with the infamous archways, wherein there are no doors at all. 
There are, it is true, two doors of sorts in the warehouse itself, but one is bricked up and the other is both rusted shut and locked from the inside. A search of the premises via the main gate failed to show any signs that it had been opened in recent years, or indeed that it could have been. It was at shortly after one o'clock on the morning of the 6th of November that Lord Fitzmaurice Banstock, toiling painfully through Thurza Street in the direction of Devonport Passage, received, or perhaps I should say became aware of, an impression that he should retrace his steps and then head north. There is no need to suggest telepathy, and certainly none to mention the supranormal in conjunction with this impression. Miss Mothermer was most probably blowing the police whistle, blowing it with lips which trembled in terror, and so weak and feeble was the sound produced that no police constable had heard it. On the conscious level of his mind, Lord Fitzmaurice did not hear it either. But there are sensual perceptions of which the normal senses are not aware, and it was these, which there can be no doubt that he, perhaps in compensation, perhaps sharpened by suffering, perhaps both, possesses to an unusual degree, which heard the sound and translated it. He obeyed the impulse, walking as fast as he could, and as he walked he was aware of the usual noises and movements in the darkness, rustlings and shufflings and whispers, breathings and mutterings, which betokened the presence of various of Dame Philippa Garrick's charges. It seemed to him that they were of a different frequency, as he put it to himself, accustomed to think in wireless radio terms this night that they were uncommonly uneasy. It seemed to him that he could sense their terror. And as he turned the corner into Salem Yard, he saw something glitter, he saw something flash, and he knew in that instant that it was the famous negro-head opal, which he had seen that one time before, when his lady cousin occasioned the assistance of the Metropolitan Police to rescue the girl Bessie Lovejoy, then in process of being purchased for the ill-famed Kawaja of al Kabur by the ineffably evil Mortilal Smith. It glittered and flashed in the cold and the darkness, and then it was gone. Fenugreek Close is long and narrow and ill-lit. Its western and longest extremity, where the Lascar bin Alley perished with the cold on the night of St. Sylvester, being a cul-de-sac inhabited, when it is inhabited at all, by Oriental seamen who club together and rent the premises whilst they await a ship but there were none such that night. It was there, pressed against the blank and filthy wall, pressing feebly as if her wren-like little body might obtain entry and safety and sanctuary, sobbing in almost incoherent terror, that Lord Fitzmaurice Banstock found the crouching form of Miss Mothermer. The police whistle was subsequently discovered by the infamous archways, and Miss Mothermer had insisted that, although she would have sounded it, she did not, for, she says, she could not find it, although she remembers Dame Philippa pressing it into her hand. On this point she is quite vehement, yet one is no more apt to credit it than her statement about the open door, towards which they were led by the man without a nose— for if Miss Mothermer did not blow upon the whistle, who did? The noble and misfortunate lord did not waste breath inquiring of his cousin's companion if she were all right, it being patent that she was not. He demanded instead what had become of Dame Philippa, and upon hearing the name Miss Mothermer became first quite hysterical and then unconscious. Lord Fitzmaurice lifted her up and carried her to the place of rendezvous, where, exactly on time, Morwinnie, his chauffeur footman, had just arrived with the Rolls motor car. They drove immediately to Banstock House, where she was given brandy and put to bed by Mrs. Ox, the cook, whilst Lord Fitzmaurice summoned the police. An alarum had already been given, or at any rate an alarum of sorts. 
one of the wretchedly miserable folk to whose succour Dame Philippa devoted so much of her time, having somehow learned that she was in danger, had informed Police Sergeant L. Robinson to this effect. This man's name is not known. He is, or at any event was, called by the curious nickname of Tea and Two Slices, these being the only words which he was usually heard to utter, and then only in a sort of whisper when ordering the only items he was known to buy. His age, background, residence, and present whereabouts are equally unknown. He had apparently an absolute horror of well-lighted and much-frequented places, and an utter terror of policemen, one cannot tell why, and it may be hard to imagine what agonies and efforts it must have cost him to make his way to the police station and inform Sergeant Robinson that he must go at once and help the lady. Unfortunately, and for unknown reasons, he chose to make his way to the police station in Whitechapel, instead of to the nearer one in Shadewell. His testimony would be of the utmost importance, but it cannot now be obtained, for, after giving the alarm, he scurried forth into the night again, and has not been seen since. The matter is otherwise with the testimony of the seaman Greenbrier. It is available, it is copious, it fits in with that of Miss Mothermer. It is unfortunate that it is quite unbelievable. Unbelievable, that is, unless one is willing to cast aside every conceivable limit of credulity, and to accept that on the night of Guy Fawkes Day in that year of our sovereign Lord King George V, the great and ancient city of London was the scene of a visitation more horrible than any in its previous history. Albert Edward Greenbrier, able-bodied seaman, is thirty-one years of age, and except for two occasions on which he was fined, respectively two pounds and two pounds ten shillings, for being drunk and disorderly, he has never been in any trouble with the authorities. On the 1st of November he landed at St. Catherine Docks aboard the merchant vessel Salem Tower, from the straight settlements with a cargo of rubber, copper, and tinned pineapples. Neither the Salem Tower nor Greenbrier had been in the United Kingdom for the space of eleven months, and consequently, when paid off, he was in possession of a considerable sum of money. In the course of one week he had, with the assistance of several women who were probably prostitutes, dissipated the entire sum. On discovering this, the women, who share a communal flat in Poplar, asked him to leave. It was Greenbrier's intention to obtain another ship, but in this endeavour he was unsuccessful. He managed to obtain a loan of half a crown from a casual acquaintance, and spent the night at a bed-and-breakfast place in Ropemaker's Fields Limehouse. The following evening, footsore and hungry, and, save for a single sixpence, penniless, he found himself in the commercial road, where he entered a cookshop, whose signboard announced that good tea, bread, smelts, and chips were obtainable for that sum. Obtainable they were, good they were not, but he was in no position to object. Having finished, he inquired the way to the convenience, and there retired. On emerging, he observed that he was next to the back door which opened onto Argyle Court, although he did not know that was its name, and on looking out he espied a sign. The sign is still there, in white calligraphy of a fine Spenserian sort, upon a black background it reads, Seamen's Lodging House, Good Beds, E. Llewellyn Prop. Albert Edward Greenbrier entered, rang the bell for the governor, and upon the instant saw a panel open in the wall through which a face looked at him. It was the face of a gigantic cherub, white and dimpled and bland, surmounted by a pall of curly hair. In short, it was the face of Evan Bach Llewellyn. 
Greenbrier, in a few words, stated his situation, and offered to give over his seaman's papers as a surety, until such time as he might obtain a ship, in return for bed and board. The governor thrust forth a huge, pale hand, took the documents, slid shut the panel, and presently appeared to beckon Greenbrier down a corridor, at the end of which was a dimly lit dormitory. He gave him a thin blanket, which was all in all not quite so filthy as it might have been, informed him that gaming and novel reading were not permitted on the premises, invited him to take any bed he chose, and forthwith withdrew. Greenbrier found an empty pallet, under the head of which he placed his shoes, not so much as a pillow as a precaution, drew the cover about him, and fell instantly asleep. He was awakened several times by the entry of other men, some of whom appeared to have been flung rather than escorted into the room, and once he was awakened by the sound of the proprietor playing upon a small patent organ, a hymn of his own composition, on the subject of the priesthood of Melchizedek. Greenbrier gazed at the tiny blue tip of the nightlight as it burned tremulously in the twisted jet, and on the odd and grotesque shadows cast upon the stained and damp-streaked walls by the tossings and turnings of the lodgers, and listened to the no less odd nor grotesque noises made by them. It was only by the start he gave upon being awakened that he realized that he had gone to sleep again. Who awakened him he did not know, but although the light was no brighter, there was a stir in the dormitory, and men were getting to their feet, and he heard the word scoff repeated several times. He dashed water on his face, and moved with the others into what was evidently the main kitchen of the establishment. To his surprise he observed that the clock there read eleven o'clock. It was too dark to be morning— Evidently he had slept only a few hours, or he had slept round the clock and a bit more. It seemed an odd hour for victuals, but he was beginning to conceive the idea that this was an odd place. Broiled bloaters, fried sausage, potatoes, cabbage, and sprouts were being turned out of pots and pans, and dumped higgledy-piggledy onto cracked and not over-clean plates, and tea was steaming in coarse crockery cups. No one ventured to eat or drink, however, until Evan Bach Llewellyn had pronounced a grace in the Kimrick tongue, and immediately after the Amen imparted a piece of information. Videlicet, that he had a ship for them. It was a good ship, too, he said. They would all be very pleased with it. It was not one of their dirty old English tubs, but a fine modern vessel. He urged them all to eat hearty of the scoff, or victuals, so that no time need be lost in getting aboard. And he then produced a large bottle of gin, and proceeded to pour a generous portion into each cup, with many assurances that it was free and would come out of his own commission. No sooner had he given the signal, with a wave of his pale and dimpled paw, than the men fell to like so many ravening wolves, cramming the hot food into their mouths, and gulping down the gin and lemon tea. Greenbrier concedes that the ailment was savoury, and, finding himself hungrier than he had thought, took but a hasty swallow of the drink before addressing himself at length to the solids. A furtive movement at his elbow caused him to cease abruptly. The man to his right, a hulking fellow with red hair and an exceedingly dirty face, was emptying a mug and looking at him out of the corner of his eye. It took but a second to ascertain that the wretched fellow had all but drained his own supply, and then switched cups, and was now doing away with Greenbriars, who contented himself with stealing a link of the man's sausage, whilst the latter was elaborately gazing elsewhere. Stealing himself to meet this man's resentment, he was dumbfounded to observe the fellow fall upon his face into the mashed potatoes and sprouts on his plate. Within a matter of seconds, almost as if it were one of the contagious seizures which takes hold at times of the unfortunate patients of an institution for the epileptic, within a matter of seconds, then, 
all the others at the table sank down into unconsciousness, and Greenbrier, following suit, knew no more. He awoke to a scene of more than gothic horror. He lay with his head against the silent form of another man, another one he could feel the weight of on his legs, and others lay like dead men all about. They were not dead, he knew, for he could hear them breathing. The room where they lay was walled and floored and roofed in stone, and at regular intervals were carvings in bas-relief of a strange and totally unfamiliar sort. Paraffin lamps were set into niches here and there. There was a humming noise whose origin was not visible to him. Very slowly, so as not to attract attention, for he could hear voices, Greenbrier turned his head. As he did so, he felt that there was a rope tied around his neck, and a sudden and quite involuntary convulsive movement which he gave upon this discovery disclosed to him that his hands were similarly bound. Thus urged on to even greater caution, the man took quite a long time in shifting his position so as to obtain some intelligence of his surroundings. If what he had seen before was strange and uneasy enough, what he saw now was sufficient to deprive him for the moment of the use of his limbs altogether. After one side, bound and linked, arms to arms and necks to necks, like a prostrate caffle of slaves, and to all appearance also unconscious, were the bodies of a number of women— how many he could not say, but evidently less than the number of the men. This, however, and however shocking even to the sensibilities of a seafarer, this was nothing. Directly in front of his gaze, which was at an angle, and seated upon a sort of altar, was a figure, as it were, out of eastern clime, red bronze in colour, hideous of visage, and with six arms. Bowing low before it was a man who addressed it in placatory tones and with many fawning gestures. No other thought occurred to the British sailor at that moment but that he was in some sort of clandestine Hindu temple, and that he and all his other companions would presently be sacrificed before this idol, not being aware that such is not the nature of character of the Hindu religion, which contains, despite numerous errors and not a few gross importunities, many sublime and lofty thoughts. But, be that as it may, the red bronze-coloured figure proceeded to move its limbs. The torso stirred. The entire body leaned forward. The figure spoke, and as it spoke it seized the man with four of its limbs and struck him with the other two. Then it dropped him. As he scrambled to his feet, his face was turned so that the sailor could see it, and he saw that it had no nose. Greenbrier must once again have passed into unconsciousness. When again he awoke, the altar was empty, and he could not see the idol, but he could hear its voice. It was speaking in anger, and as one used to command. Another voice began when this one, deep, hollow, dreadful, had ceased. The new voice was a thin one, and it took a moment for him to realize that, despite its curious, snuffling quality, it was speaking a sort of English. Two other voices replied to it also in English. One was that of Evan Bach Llewellyn, the other one he did not know. By his description of both speech and speaker, for in a moment the latter moved into view, it is apparent that this was no other than the inhuman and unconscionable Eurasian Mortilal Smith. Something, it seemed, was not enough. There was an insufficiency of something. This it was which occasioned the wrath of the person or creature with the six arms— and he was also in great concern because of a shortage of time. All four, the creature with six arms, the man without a nose, Smith, and Llewellyn, kept moving about. 
Presently there was the scrape of wood, and then a thud, and then the wet and dirty odour of the river. The thought occurred to Greenbrier that they might be thrown into the Thames, which was then at high tide. He reflected that, in common with a great many seamen, he had never learned to swim, and then, for a third time, he fainted. When he awoke, he could hear someone singing the doxology, and he thought, so he says, that he had died and was now in heaven. One glance as he opened his eyes was enough to undeceive him. He lay where he had before, and everything was as it was before, save that there were two people present who he is certain were not there before, and by his description of them they were clearly Dame Philippa Garrick and her secretary companion, Miss Mothermer. Miss Mothermer was crouched down with her hands over her eyes, whether in prayer or terror or not inconceivably both, he could not say. Dame Philippa, however, was otherwise engaged, for she moved from insensate figure to insensate figure, and the light gleamed upon the scissors with which she was severing their bonds. She spoke to each, shook them, but was able to elicit no response. At this Greenbrier regained his voice and entreated her help. She proceeded to cut the ropes which bound him, and left off her singing of the doxology to inquire of him if he had any knowledge as to why they were all of them being detained, and what was intended to be done with them. He was assuring her that he did not know when a door opened, and Miss Mothermer began to scream. That a fight ensued is certain. Greenbrier was badly cut about, and Miss Mothermer received bruises which were a long time in vanishing, though in this I refer only to bruises of the flesh. Those of the spirit are still, alas, with her. But he can provide us with few details of the conflict. Certain it is that he escaped. Equally certain, so did Miss Mothermer. Dame Philippa plainly did not. Greenbrier was discovered at about half-past one of the morning, wandering in a daze in the vicinity of the Mile End Road, by a very conscientious alien named Grabowski, or Grabowski, who summoned medical attention and the police. Little or no attention would or could have been paid to Greenbrier's account, had it not been for his description of the two ladies. His relation, dovetailing as it did with that of Miss Mothermer, left the police no choice but to cause a search to be made of the area of Argyle Court, in one corner of which a false nose was found. Acting on the information received and under authority of a warrant, Superintendent Sneath, together with a police sergeant and a number of constables, entered Llewellyn's premises, which they found completely deserted. Soundings of the walls and floors indicated the presence of passageways and rooms which could have had no place in a properly conducted establishment licensed under the Common Lodging Houses Act, and these were broken into. A cap belonging to Greenbrier was found in one of these corridors, as was part of the lanyard of Dame Philippa's police whistle. There was a perfect maze or rabbit warren of them, and on the lowest level there was discovered that chamber, the existence of which was previously publicly unknown, and which Professor Singleton of the University of London has pronounced to be a genuine mithrarium of the reign of Marcus Aurelius, or perhaps Nerva and which was used by the unscrupulous Llewellyn for the illicit portion of his professional activity. It would have been here that the captives were assembled, if Greenbrier's account is to be believed. What is, as a first premise, obvious is that it cannot possibly be believed. That Lord Fitzmaurice Banstock has chosen to believe it is, I am constrained to say, a greater testimony to the powers of his imagination than to any inherently credible elements in the story. The man Greenbrier now forms part of the staff of Banstock House. This is entirely the affair of Lord Fitzmaurice himself, and requires no comment on my own part, nor shall it obtain any. 
It may, however, be just as well to include some opinions and observations which are the fruits of Lord Fitzmaurice's very understandingly deep concern in this tragic and intensely puzzling affair. He has collected a number of reports of some sort of aquatic disturbance moving downstream from London River early in the morning of the 6th of November, just about the time of the turning of the tide. To this he compares a report of the Astronomer Royals concerning an arc of light which appeared off the Nore immediately subsequent. These have led him to the opinion that a craft of unknown origin and nature moved under water from London to the sea, and then rose not only above the surface of the water, but into the air itself. This craft, or vessel, was captained by the creature with the six arms, and the man without a nose would have been an inferior officer aboard of her. Somehow this vessel became short of personnel and applied to Evanbach Llewellyn to make up the shortage by crimping or shanghaiing the requisite number. For reasons which cannot be known and concerning which I, for one, would rather not speculate, several women were also required. Lord Fitzmaurice is of the opinion that they were required only for such duties as members of their sex commonly fulfil in the mercantile navies of various foreign nations, such as service in the steward's branch. This being out of Llewellyn's line of business, an appeal was made by him to the notorious and wicked Eurasian Mortilal Smith, who is known to have left his headquarters in the semi-detached villa in Maida Vale on the 5th of November, whither he never returned. Lord Fitzmaurice suggests two possible provenances for this curious and hypothetical vessel— Suppose, he suggests, the being with the six arms to have been the original of the many East Indian and Buddhist myths depicting such creatures. It is likely, then, that the ship or submarine aeroplane emanated from the vast and unexplored regions in the mountains which ring round the northern plateau of Tibet the inhabitants of which have for centuries been rumoured to possess knowledge far surpassing ours, and which they jealously guard from the mundane world. The other possibility is even less likely, and is reminiscent, I fear, far more of the romances associated with the pen of Mr. Herbert G. Wells, a journalist of radical tendencies, than with proper scientific attitudes. Do not the discoveries of Professor Schiaparelli, establishing that there are canals upon the planet Mars, demonstrate that the inhabitants thereof must be given to agricultural pursuits, in which case how unlikely that they should engage themselves in filibustering or blackbirding expeditions to, of all conceivable places, the civilized capital city of the British Empire. Lord Fitzmaurice thinks that this theoretical craft of his must have carried off the unscrupulous Evanbach Llewellyn in order to make up the tally of captives. How much more likely it is that this wicked man has merely fled to escape detection, prosecution, and punishment, perhaps to the mountains of wild Wales, where the king's writ runs scarcely more than it does in the mountains of Tibet. Concerning the present whereabouts of Mortilal Smith, we are on firmer ground. That he intended to devise harm to Dame Philippa, who had on far more than one occasion interfered with him in his nefarious traffickings, we need not doubt. The close search of Superintendent Sneath of the premises on and about Argyle Court, Primrose Alley, Fenu Greek Close, and Salem Yard uncovered a sodden mass of human clay lying part in and part out of a pool of muck far under the notorious archways. It was the drowned body of Mortil Al Smith himself. Both from the evidence of his own powerful physique and the presence of many footprints thereabouts, it is clear that a number of persons were required and were found to force him into that fatal submersion.
The friends, silent though they are to the world, dumb by virtue of their affliction and suffering, the friends of Dame Philippa Garrick, the so-called and by no means ill-named people of the abyss, whom she so constantly and so assiduously attended upon, had avenged their one friend and sole protector. It must now, one fears, go ill with them. The body of this unspeakably evil man, as well as his entire and vast estate, except the famous negro-head opal which has never found, was at once claimed by his half-brother, Mr. Krishna Banerjee. The body was removed to Benares, and there subjected to that incomplete process of combustion at the burning ghats, peculiar to the Hindu persuasion, and has long since become the prey of the wandering crocodiles which scavenge perpetually up and down the sacred waters of the river Ganga. As I commence my last words for the present on the subject of this entire tragic affair, I must confess myself baffled. Inacceptable as Lord Fitzmaurice's theories are, there are really no others that I can offer in their place. All is uncertainty. All that is, save my conviction that Dame Philippa's noble and humanitarian labours still continue, no matter under what strange stars and skies. Afterward, to what strange stars and skies. The theme of Lady Bountiful appealed to Avram. Despite his own poverty, he was always sympathetic to the outstretched hand of a beggar on the street. Among his papers, after he passed on, we found a manuscript titled Everybody Has Somebody in Heaven, which appears in the collection of Avram's Jewish fantasies by the same title. It's the tale of Tanta Sora Rivka, a saintly Jewish woman who distributes bagels to the poor. Clearly, Tantasora and Dame Philippa are related, gracious sisters of generosity, wherever they may appear. Grania Davis. We're back. What would you think? I really enjoy the story. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, jumped, what jumped out at you? I, mean, what... um, I like the setting and the character of Dame Philippa. She just, she exemplifies something good about humanity. It's not just this bleak view, but it doesn't ignore that there's bad elements to people as well. So it's a very kind of realistic view of people and not just something ultra positive or ultra negative. I, I really liked a couple of things that jumped out at me. I really liked how Avram, and, and he's done this before, how he weaved in, for example, H.G. Wells. Yeah, um, yeah. How he weaved in, I think it was Giovanni Schiaparelli, the astronomer. You know, in, in The Golem, which I don't know if you've ever read The Golem, he weaves in Asimov. Oh, wait, The Golem, yes. I yeah. get it, yes. <laughs> yeah, so, so it's, it's fascinating how he just kind of weaves in these authors that he obviously really respects. Um, and then I love some of the details, like Dame uh, Philippa's uh, uh, kit pack that she brings around. And it, I remember I was, I was, of course, had to look it up where she talked about the 15 packets of five woodbine cigarettes, into each which she had thrust six wooden matches. And then I went and looked, and there are these like old little old time cigarettes. And you could see how she'd be able to stick everything in there. Uh, so, I mean, that was fascinating to me. And then, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that was, that was one thing. The obviously, um, and hopefully I say this right. Mo, Mo, Motolo, Motolo Smith. I mean, so evil and, and hideous. Um, and then I had some questions. Would any, anything else jump out at you? Um, I guess. One of the other things that jumped out to me was just the way he incorporated the alien kind of creature at the end with all the arms right. <laughs> and like the hieroglyphics that were obviously this creature's language 
that was very interesting. And then it's on Guy Fox Day, and that's just like this perfect serendipity for this horrible thing to happen. Um, one of the other aliens in this little <laughs> evil ring there, having no nose and this twisted face, it kind of made me think of, even though it's supposed to be his mouth, the character Eugene that's in Preacher, he's got this really distorted face. And it's not because he's an alien, but that's what I imagined it <laughs> as. <laughs> so, so a couple questions that I had, one that just I wanted to know the answer is who was telling the story? Yeah. <laughs> you know, was it was it like a court case? Was it a, was it a detective? Like you don't you never know who's telling the story, and and I, I have a feeling. I mean, Auburn would love to do that to you, make give you the sense of frustration. We won't know. We'll never know who told that story. But I, you don't know who told the story. And then um, Lord Fitzmaurice Banstock, what was his physical condition? Yeah. I don't think he ever said what it was. So that left you left you uh, guessing. Yeah, but that character in particular, I really admired that he was included because that was a man who had a disability and yet he wasn't treated badly for it, even though he was very self-conscious of it. Interesting. He and was included in the story and especially in that time frame, to have any representation of someone that had a disability oh. at all. I didn't think, wow, I, that, that never, I, I never, I never thought about that. I know Avram was fought with, with this, you know, from when he was a medic in World War II, um, he had some issues that, that came from that, that, that were affected him his entire life. So yeah, intriguing, interesting. Uh, well, one of the things I always love to do is if I turn a story into uh, a movie or a series and who would play the part. So for uh, Dame Philippa, and I, I mentioned that I might do this, and uh, Modal Smith, did you, did you pick anybody that you saw as playing those parts? I'm curious. I did. Yeah. There's an actress, she's British, named Juliet Stevenson. Okay. And she's been in a lot of period pieces. And I think she would play that well. She has a good range. Okay. She's very funny, but I think she could also play that character very well. Okay. She um, was in um, Truly Madly Deeply. And that was a movie from the 90s. And it had Alan Rickman in it as well. And it was kind of a drama fantasy story involving a ghost. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a good story. And then she's done a lot of pieces like... Emma and oh, wow. I, I think she was in Sense and Sensibility, a version of it. <laughs> I, I, I went big, I went big Hollywood and I, I kept going back and forth, but I looked up how tall she was, uh, which is uh, Kate Winslet. Uh huh. And she's English. Uh, she's five, seven. I thought that was tall enough. And uh, so, so I, I, I chose her. And then for uh, Modal Smith, I thought, so this one, oh my gosh, if he was younger, it was just a no brainer. I was thinking Ben Kingsley um, from Schindler's List and Gandhi. He, you know, I think he's in his seventies now and I felt like the character may be a little bit younger. So I thought maybe uh, Cal Penn who plays Harold and Kumar, give him a little okay. bit. <laughs> um, you know, it'd be fun to play someone so hideously evil. How about, how about you? Um, if he was younger, I would say Alexander Siddig, who played um, Julian Bashir in Star Trek DS9. Ooh. And he's played a lot of villains, and I love him. <laughs> 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 and my other choice, also because I love him, would be Asif Monfi. <laughs> oh, nice. I like it. Uh, well, wh what are you working on now? In terms um, now I'm drafting a story called Deeper Than Blood, okay. and it's inspired by kind of um, Irish folklore, and it's kind of like Aquaman meets Outlander. Well, I like it. I can't wait. <laughs> I'm definitely going to have to get it. Well, 
you know, I think, you know, I can't thank you enough for coming on and, and, and do, taking the time. Uh, you know, for those of you who are interested in learning more about Melissa, you can find her at melissaroserogers.com. Is that correct? That's right. Don't, don't look up Melissa Rose author because you'll f- end up finding Melissa Rose Brooks because I made that mistake. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, expert on religion in American life. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then just some, some quick housekeeping. Uh, for those of you who are new, please check out AuburnDavidson.com. Join the fan club so I can make sure to let you know what's going on. Uh, and for those of you listening, please write a nice review, spread the word. And, you know, thank you again so much, Melissa, for joining me. Thank you, Seth. It was good to see you. You too.